welcome to day two of uh, What's New in Electronics Live 2019. Um, I'm joined by Michael Ford from Aegis and David Green from Humiseal. Um, I'd like to talk about the skills gap and the problem of... Uh, I go into a lot of companies and they're all recruiting and they're all having problems getting the skilled people they need. There's a lot of competition for those people and they're having to offer higher and higher salaries to get them in. So why aren't people coming into the industry or why aren't people there with the, the skills they need? To? Um, first of all, I think that there are people coming in, but the people who are coming in are snapped up. Uh, as you said, the higher salaries, uh, we've heard some ridiculous offers for people uh, who are you know, even capable in a certain field. And they will be, especially for like smart manufacturing, these kinds of things, industry 4.0, anyone who has that on their CV and can actually show some experience, there is a, a large demand for that. If we go though, if we think about the kind of skills that are needed, I think we need to change the way that we think about what the requirements are. Because to endlessly search for people who have experience in an area where we're really looking for people to come in, you know, by definition, there isn't that experience. So rather than that, we have to judge who are the best people who would be suitable for coming into the industry. Now, there are two ways of looking at that. Uh, first of all, do they need a college education or, or are they just basically having a certain set of key skills that enable them to do a job effectively? And what is that job that they're going to do? Is it the same as we saw 10 years or 20 years ago? Or is it now being affected so much by you know, the digital factory, the use of computers, and having the know-how of the technology, whether it's chemical, mechanical, or process, actually built into the, the great machines that we see, the great processes? You know, that's where the know-how resides. So do these people need to be able to understand all of that to the level that they used to? Or are they people who are actually going to be running the processes and can do multiple types of processes rather than, than be a highly specialized in one particular area. So I think we need to think about the type of roles we're looking for people, make those attractive through the use of digital technology and understanding that they don't need to get their fingers dirty and be a specialist. And that should attract a lot, you know, a bigger range of people who may not necessarily be the very top of the you know, education list. Do you think, uh, Derek, I mean, We've got an education system, certainly in the UK, that seems to have geared itself purely to getting people to do GCSEs, A-levels, university, as some kind of holy grail that will guarantee you career and riches forevermore. But that's not really true, is it? Uh, I am a great believer in apprenticeships, in teaching people from the bottom up, and I think this drive from the mid-80s to have over 50% of our school leavers go into university has been wrong. It's giving us uh, young people with what I call soft degrees and with a lot of debt. And they have to pay that debt off over the years. If they actually come out of school, started a career, learnt on the job, went to college, day release or evenings, something like that, then they would have a career in the future and as you were saying they would learn on the job and they would learn about the kit they're now, they're now having to, to deal with. And that's where I stand. Um, actually just to add to that, I mean for, for me as a software background, uh, I've recruited a lot of software people and I never really saw the advantage of having a high level degree in computing. Uh, a lot of the people who were the best programmers had a certain personality, a certain creativity that they would be able to utilize by writing code. I mean, writing code isn't actually difficult. Really, the difficulty is mapping the requirement to the code that you're making. And the people who have that skill are the most valuable. Education actually doesn't matter. And. Uh, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because it, it's, it's very much a mindset. You want the people that have that right mindset, the thirst to do that, and the, thir the, the ability to soak it up, take it on board, and then apply that to different aspects of um, the, the process. Do you think we also, 
education is veered away from what technology industry and we need in the 21st century is that like you say people coming out with specific niche skills kind of they, they're kind of pigeonholed straight away we need people that have a broad set of skills that can be applied to a really changing landscape absolutely and uh, I think that's what you get from going in as a youngster and working with the more senior people within a company and learning on the job rather than sitting in university and just learning it um, to pass an exam. Mm. I, I have heard companies voice a concern though that with apprenticeships, some of them get stung by taking someone on board, bringing them up to a certain level, and then when they've um, gained a, a level of competence or achieved a, you know, pass an exam, whatever, they're then off looking for the best job they can get anywhere. So they can't, some business, we need a way that businesses can retain that knowledge and experience they've nurtured rather than feeling they've done all that work and then, then lose them. Yeah, there, there is that. And if it was the case where one company was doing apprenticeships and nobody else was, that would be true. But there are a lot of factors that keep the loyalty of a person who's done an apprenticeship to the company that's trained them. Not least of which is they know the people, they know the operation, they know the products they're working on, the kind of things that they're doing, the machines. But also there aren't that many companies doing exactly the same thing in a local area. So a lot of them would have to move geographically, which you know, many of them don't want to do because of families and things like that. So it's not just... I, I don't think you can assume that somebody that's completed an apprenticeship takes away the certificate and says, right, you know, I'm off on the world stage now and I'm going to earn my fortune. Some may do that. A lot of them will stay where they are. They will then, you know, work through the organization and, you know, be very successful in what they do. And there are no guarantees in this world, but the value that the apprentices bring because they've had time doing the real job I think that's by far the overriding value. And I think it's up to the companies to actually put a career path mm. in place for their apprentices, yes. to keep them there, to give them a future and, and make them want to stay. Do you think there's enough companies actually offering apprenticeships and can those apprenticeships be found easily you know, for people who, when they're presented with the education path of university, are some of these apprenticeship opportunities being sidelined by the establishment? I, I personally think that it's down to the schools to start pushing apprenticeships as hard as they're pushing degrees going to university. And I think that's where it's got to start. And they've got to have companies in to explain to the students what the career path is and what that will do for them. I think the perception of what apprentice program is has changed a little bit because I think originally an apprentice was like you know master and apprentice they were really learning the craft and they were expected to stay forever maybe that was in the 1800s or 1900s but um, then it became something where the government provided some incentive to companies they would you know yeah. contribute to the cost and it kind of became a way of getting cheap labor that was a mistake because it isn't a way of getting cheap labor. That's completely ignoring the whole point of an apprenticeship. I think the tables come around now where people are realizing, due to the skills shortage, the value of actual apprentices. So, you know, whoever is paying for that, whatever the process is these days with support from government and other organizations, it is being done genuinely now. And so that should pick up as we see the reality <laughs> of the jobs market changing and needing different sets of skills and realizing that, okay, we need to create those ourselves. Working with educators, as you said, is absolutely essential. And I, I do see a lot of programs where you know, business and universities are working together to kind of bridge this kind of divide. So whether they are real apprentices or not, that's the kind of uh, program that I think is going to work. And you, you raised some really interesting points yesterday in one of the uh, talks about how AR and VR is helping operators multitask, uh, keep abreast of what needs doing, keep abreast of developments, but also making really effective use of their time. Are apprenticeships a way for businesses 
to be able to channel people into that way of working, you know, if they're on board with that to start with. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, for me in manufacturing, when I saw lines, you know, production lines, and you have people putting in components the same thing day in, day out, is anybody going to aspire to a career doing that? It's kind of attracting the people who really can't do anything else or don't really want to do anything else or just want money for a short time. You know, it's that kind of caliber. Today, people are growing up with new technologies. They are using VR headsets to play games. And, you know, games are games, but it's also an experience about using digital technology. So with our software, for example, we have actually integrated the augmented reality into the manufacturing operation itself. So when people come along, it's not like, oh, I've got something to wear. It's weird and strange. And am I going to have headaches or whatever with this all day? They're used to it now. And they're saying, well, you know, if you can tell me what to do, I can do almost anything. So you could put a complete idiot into a factory like myself, <laughs> walks through the door, puts on his AR glasses, and it directs me what to do. I need to go and do a maintenance job here, a quality check there, a material logistics, maybe some assembly work. But because I'm seeing the exact instructions and pictures and drawings and videos in my glasses of what to do, I could actually do that. So I, I'm not saying that we all need to be idiots <laughs> to go in and join manufacturing, but it means that people can have a much more rewarding experience utilizing the latest technologies in creative roles in different areas of the factory every single day. And where better to learn those but actually whilst working for a company? That's right, and I think the youngsters of the day have these computing skills and, and by playing games, by using VR headsets, etc. So they're virtually job ready in some aspects to come in and learn exactly what uh, you want them to do. So you end up with a smart factory and a smart workforce. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, actually. You, you, the two go together. And, yeah. you know, we, we do tend to think about smart factories as machines and automation and things like that, but we forget the most flexible asset we've ever had and ever will have are the people. Yeah. And they really matter to what we're doing in terms of quality and production. So we need to make them a part of it. And this is an ideal way to do it. And it really raises that expectation of people coming into the industry. Yeah. What was the example you used the other day of um, was Mercedes took the robots off a line because... <laughs> yeah, it was a couple of years ago, the, uh, the S-Class. Um, because there are so many options, you know, when you buy a car, you look at the option list. No two cars they make are the same, really. And so there was a, an article that said, you know, they found that the application of automation and robotics was simply not flexible enough. And so they re-equipped the line with human operators, and it was far more productive. So, you know, there, there is definitely room and space in the overall business plan of the digital factory for this kind of manual operation. I guess also the, the biggest thing we've got to get over this p misconception that a, an apprenticeship is somehow lesser to a degree. Yep, I, I firmly believe that uh, that is one of the things we have to get across to the youngsters today, that they can achieve, even without going to university, they can achieve something in their lives. And, uh, and they don't need that degree to, to do that. No, and it's, it's, it's heartening that um, businesses can step up to this, the plate, really, with this. The, the, the opportunities there from both sides, aren't they, for business? Because it, it, it benefits businesses, doesn't it? You, yeah. you get a, 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 more, a, a workforce that's more skilled, that's more attuned into what you're actually doing. Yeah. You yeah. Need, Sorry. I, no, I was going to say, you can mould them into what you want. Mm. Somebody else hasn't done that before, thinking that's what, that's what industry wants. They don't know. It's, industry knows what it wants, and you need to be able to mould those youngsters. It's interesting that these, these uh, all these different strands of what a, a, a smart factory, Industry 4.0, the IoT, AI, all these things, they're all starting to coalesce, mm -hmm. aren't they? And it, it, it's actually pulling the human element in to a bigger degree than we thought to start with. It goes to motivation, um, because when I was a student and deciding what to do as a future kind of education and career, I, I loved music, and music for me was reproduced by equipment, record players, cassette recorders in those days. I wanted to know how they worked, I wanted to know how to make them better, how to, you know, um, be a part of that. And that drove my career path. 
I studied electronics, I made my own electronics, I joined a company that was, you know, making that kind of kit and I got interested in the manufacturing side and you know, I like to fiddle myself with a bit of electronics. So it was all part of that initial motivation that I had. I mean, everybody is driven by a different motivation, but where that motivation includes the use of a product or the creation of something, then you know, this is a direction they can go into. The difficult decision is, when I go to university, what course is going to fulfill my requirement in that? And in my case, the course I did was related, but it wasn't directly related with what I ended up doing. Uh, I almost, well, I did teach myself software programming. It wasn't part, part of the course. I really made a mistake. It was a great course and everything was fine, but my interest, my passion kind of was slightly different. So, you know, the danger is that people can be pushed into something that isn't right for them. They lose their motivation and therefore they become just every day the same kind of thing. They don't get the opportunities that really light them up. Whereas people who go for their passion actually will be the ones who get into a job and really start to grow and really start to add value quickly. Yeah. And you did an apprenticeship, didn't you, Derek? I did and uh, I qualified. And I'm afraid I'm one of the ones that left the company that gave me the apprenticeship <laughs> after two years <laughs> and uh, joined a company called AEG Telefunken and they saw something and put me on their management training course and I honestly haven't looked back since. Well, what better testament can you have? So. <laughs> Thank you very much gentlemen, it was a very interesting talk. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.